Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, in an academic arena, we uh, in Africa, especially, we usually give five minutes. We call it academic time. Yes. So I was like trying to make sure that uh, we respect five minutes to allow many people to join. I know some of them are popping in, uh, but uh, we can start now. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I can't. Uh, uh, know who is there, who is not there, but we'll have time to, uh, you know, welcome all members, uh, know some of them. Uh, it's a good time for all of us uh, in this new normal to connect and uh, exchange about uh, our shared experience for now. Uh, international arbitration, especially in Africa. As you know, uh, African Arbitration Association has been organizing a series of webinars and um, been enjoying some of them. And uh, this one is a part of uh, that series. Um, I, Dr. Fidel Masengo, uh, many of you know me, I'm uh, the General Secretary of the Kigali International Arbitration Center. I'm an arbitrator as well, I'm a mediator, I'm a senior lecturer of law at um, various universities. Uh, in Rwanda and East Africa. I've uh, been a lawyer for many years. Yeah, I'm also a pastor, so uh, uh, there are many things I can say about myself, but I don't like to just um, introduce myself in that way. But just uh, call me Fidel Masengo. That's, uh, that's the right way of introducing myself. Um, I'm uh, really... Um, uh, blessed this morning to interact with uh, Duncan, whom I want to introduce uh, to the audience. Duncan Bakshaw is um, um, uh, a very well-known, um, I can call him African-European uh, lawyer and arbitrator as well. And um, I will be trying to share his um, uh, brief CV because I can't uh, go into details before engaging ourselves in a deep discussion, let me just uh, briefly introduce to you uh, Mr. Duncan, um, who is a barrister and partner at Howard Kennedy in London. He practices uh, international commercial arbitration and international litigation. Um, and, um, uh, he has been in uh, many arbitration relating to Africa. Uh, uh, people can tell that the, the men of uh, our participants have uh, had time to meet him. And uh, between 2012-2015, he served as the first registrar of uh, RCA MIAC uh, Arbitration Center in Mauritius. Uh, he then moved to Stephenson uh, Howard uh, in London. Uh, where he worked as a counsel in the African uh, team. Uh, in 2019, he joined Howard Kennedy as a partner, and he has many distinctions, uh, including his recognition as an expert in international arbitration and energy related dispute by Legal 500. And he was uh, this year included in the who is who legal list of top international arbitration partners. Um, Duncan uh, is still a member of uh, the advisory board of uh, the Mark uh, Arbitration Center in Mauritius. And uh, he also helped many other arbitral institutions uh, uh, in Africa. Uh, he's also a board member of uh, Yumbani, Yumbani means uh, at home, UK, uh, which raises money for a charitable foundation, providing education and support for children in Kenya affected by HIV. When I say Yumbani, it's in Swahili. So some of us uh, uh, use that language, but I remember that there are people who would love to know uh, the language uh, in which Yumbani is uh, uh, spirit. Now he's uh, regularly invited in many conferences and uh, uh, um, international arbitration events in Africa. He has been in Rwanda, he has been in Tanzania, I've met him. Now I can't uh, 
name all of them, but I know he's uh, always present in many of our events. And um, uh, that's why I say that he's half African, half European. Uh, half uh, European because he's based there now, but uh, uh, I can just say that he's an African uh, um, arbitrator. We expect um, to welcome him in Rwanda after this COVID pandemic season, I, I believe. If I can see him, uh, you know, agreeing with me. Am I right, uh, Duncan? Are you coming to Rwanda after COVID season? No question. <laughs> I, I certainly will. Uh, it, it's, it's at the top of my list of places to visit when I'm free to do it. I've really mm -hmm. felt the I've really felt the the restriction on on travel because mm -hmm. as um, as anybody who knows me well will be aware, um, I'm someone who takes advantage of the opportunities to visit places and people that are offered by international arbitration, and it's going to be mm -hmm. very interesting to see how much the the change in the world due to the COVID outbreak and the reaction to it changes our approach to traveling, yeah. meeting, um, and, and taking the time to actually be together rather than, rather than remotely. It will be interesting yeah. to see. We can talk That's more about good. that later. Duncan, you've been in Africa for many years. Uh, as I said, you've been uh, there still in 2012-2015. We're based in uh, Mauritius and I've been coming frequently in Africa. Do you speak any African language? <laughs> no, uh, I, I can't claim I do. Um, I, know, I know the amount of Swahili that your average tourist knows. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know how to say Asante Sana and Dambo right. and these words that tourists know. But uh, I, I think it's a very inspiring question because I think um, to learn more Swahili would be, uh, I think, a, a great demonstration of the importance of not just working in a place, but understanding it a little bit, a little bit better. Um, I always admire uh, the ability of uh, lawyers in, in East Africa to transition from English to, to Swahili and back again, yeah. and to, to work in both languages. And uh, yeah, the, the the ability to speak the language would be a great thing. So I think it, you, you may say to me, it's about time you need to, yeah. you need to take on some of, some of the uh, East African language or one of the East African languages at least. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. As well as French, because uh, I've realized that uh, when lawyers are like in breakout sessions or when they have like waiting for the arbitrator to call them, they um, usually shift in their own languages. They can speak French, they can speak mm -hmm. Swahili. And I've seen some international lawyers being like uh, complex somehow. They think that maybe they are talking about me, they are, you know. So you have to learn French, you have to, yeah, it's a... Let me just uh, go straight to uh, some of uh, the deep uh, aspect of our session today. Mm -hmm. Mm. You've worked um, uh, as the first registrar of the RCA MIAC for three years. What lessons did you learn in leading International Arbitration Center in Africa? Well, uh, I think I learned things about the Arbitration Center itself and things more broadly about working in uh, a region which was fairly fairly new to me back in those days and mm -hmm. which I had to try to gain some understanding of to see how I could do my job to the best of my ability and my job at that time was on the face of it to promote the center and promote Mauritius as a place to have international arbitration but I quite quickly realized that the more effective approach and I see Fidel, you doing the same thing, is an approach of developing and celebrating a shared mission and interest, not just in your own jurisdiction, mm -hmm. not just where I was in Mauritius or where you are in, in Rwanda, mm -hmm. but 
across jurisdictions. Um, and that, I think, develops your relationships from which you build an understanding of what your arbitration center actually can do. And you develop a, a shared mission, which is much more effective than each, each country or each region pulling in its own direction and not, not collaborating with, with others. So, um, for example, it was clear to me that if KIAC was holding a conference in Mauritius, it was beneficial to us to celebrate the conference and promote it and to participate in it because rather than competing, it was better that people were coming to Africa to arbitration conferences and waking up to the ability that was there, the experience that was there, the enthusiasm that was there and joining in that enthusiasm rather than trying to do it separately. So that was, that was one thing it taught me. The, the other thing it taught me more, more broadly was, and I, I mentioned this earlier, there is no substitute for spending time in a country with people from that country to try to begin to learn to understand um, how, you can, how you can effectively work there. So um, I often hear at, at conferences and things like that, you know, Africa is not a country. Africa is uh, a, a multitude of different countries and cultures. And, and that's, that's a fine statement. And it's important to be aware of it. But the only way you're really aware of it is to go to Kigali and spend time there and see the people there um, rather, than, rather than simply working on cases. Working on cases gives you a much too narrow snapshot of a place. And mm -hmm. what you need to do is be there, spend time there, um, and you get to know it. Like I always tell the joke um, about my first visit to Kigali. And I was, I was there, I was like everybody, I was marveling at the cleanliness, the organization, uh, the level of services. I, I was very impressed. But mm -hmm. the thing that made a bigger effect on me was that I went out for a jog. I went out for a run in the morning. Um, and as I was running up one of the many hills, I was getting slower and slower and slower. And I ran past a guy who was waiting for a, a pickup, waiting for a lift to take him to work. And he was looking at me and smiling as I was coming up the hill. And I was going really slowly, especially by East African standards, right? Because I'm, I'm a bit slow. And he, he pointed at me and he said, run, Forrest, run, <laughs> run, Forrest, run. And I said, I couldn't believe that he was, he was making a joke, quoting a Hollywood movie, Kind of gently making fun of my slow running. Yeah. And I, I was it, the the sort of change in my attitude from okay, this is a strange place to oh, this is a welcoming place where people are people are relaxed and and you know mm -hmm. willing to have a joke, even with some white guy who's turned up from Europe. Um, it made an impact on me. So my my point is, you know, I don't claim to understand Kigali at all. I've only been there maybe six times or seven times. By going there and going there and going there and meeting you and meeting other people, that's how you get a feel. Um, and it's also how you, how you get some trust and a relationship of trust with people that, that you can build from. So those are some of the, some of the experiences that I had that, um, that it taught me. Mm -hmm. But I should, say, I should say as well um, that, you know, I was very lucky uh, to be given that opportunity. It was a, a job that allowed me to visit, I think, 20 different African countries. And the faith uh, that was put in me by the LCIA in London, um, Adrian Winstanley in particular, who was the director general then, and uh, Salim Moulin, who is still mm -hmm. is the chairman of, of MIAC, to put me in that position, I'm very grateful for. And I think it's right to acknowledge their um, giving me that opportunity because it was, it was special to, to, to do that job. I have to say. Well, wow, that's good. Um, yeah. Maybe, do, you, do, you, um, do you have any thoughts on, on your success in Kigali? Because Kigali is, is recognized now as one of the most successful centers to have opened in recent years. What, what do you think is, is your secret? What do you think is the secret of Kiak in, in being successful? Uh, thanks, uh, um, uh, dear Duncan, for asking that question. Also, it's um, a pleasure for me to come up with, uh, um, you know, some um, 
explanation about it. Uh, you know, it's not an easy thing to start and run an nutrition institution as you've been there for uh, like three years of the beginning of uh, RCM IAC, you know it was not really easy to just build up an institution, market it and uh, um, you know uh, reach to the point where people can trust it and put uh, the center in their contract and uh, submit their cases to your center. It's not an easy road. Uh, but I can uh, mention fourfold uh, factors that has have led uh, Kiak to the level where it is now. Uh, uh, number one uh, factor is um, uh, based on the legal framework governing arbitration in Rwanda. Uh, actually, when um, uh, um, we planned to have an arbitration center, uh, it was like 2006, that was uh, uh, the project on reforming uh, commercial justice. In 2008, um, uh, um, an act of parliament was enacted, uh, Arbitration and Conciliation Act, which is an central model law, which has given a uh, legal foundation of uh, arbitration in ADR in Rwanda. So that was a good factor we, because we adopted the ancestral model law. So uh, this uh, was a good thing, a good start actually. When you start there, at least you ensure that you have a good foundation. Number two uh, factor, the institution framework was also well designed for the center. Uh, you know, uh, the center was given full autonomy, which is really needed for an arbitral institution. The center was established um, by an act of parliament following the initiative of the private sector federation. So a private uh, sector federation could see the center as their own center. It was a center for business people or the center for government. And SKIAC, uh, being a non-government uh, institution uh, 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 with a board uh, of directors composed by both Rwandese and foreign citizens was like, uh, a, um, a, I can call it like a trademark for people. People could say that now uh, the center is not run by the government. The appointment of the board members uh, not by the government. So, uh, the, you know, uh, even the general secretary uh, uh, is appointed by the board, the whole staff, uh, even the budget. Uh, I can say that at 90%, the center was uh, funded by uh, a project uh, and uh, a small percentage also came from the private sector federation. So you understand the funding mechanism uh, could also inspire a kind of autonomy. And number three factor is the impressive work uh, uh, done by Kiak management at the beginning up to now. Um, uh, since the establishment of the center, when we started the center, uh, we didn't have trained uh, arbitrators in Rwanda. No, uh, Rwanda was trained as an arbitrator. We had just had lawyers, ad hoc, uh, uh, served like ad hoc arbitrators, but were not trained in arbitration. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Kiak um, uh, trained more than 500 arbitrators but it's not only Kiak that trained them. It was a partnership between Kiak and the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators of UK. So you understand that uh, we used the, uh, uh, I mean, an institution which has a reputation and we train people up to the level of fellows. So uh, it was a really good thing. So some are fellows, others are members of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, others yeah. are associate members. We use also the CDR um, uh, for uh, training in mediation. So this was really a good thing. And um, uh, I can, be, 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 beside the capacity building efforts, I can also mention uh, how Paris can tell others, you know, when you've uh, had the case at Kiak, you can easily market the center rather than us marketing the center. Of course, we did some marketing uh, awareness uh, campaigns. We just contact, uh, contacted uh, like uh, private business people, companies, sectors like telecom sectors, banking sector, you know, my, mining sector, you know, we, we cooperative sectors. We, we tried to meet uh, some sectors in, in the country, but um, we also did some, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 seminars abroad. But uh, the main thing uh, 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 that can be mentioned on this aspect of marketing, 
uh, people could tell others, lawyers yeah. could tell yeah. others, uh, you know, Paris could tell others. And yeah. uh, lastly, I can also mention, uh, it's not the least actually, the governance aspect in the country. So uh, you better have uh, a good arbitration institution, you better have a good legal framework. Mm. But when the governance in the country is not good, people will not be, uh, you know, um, tempted to go there because they know that there are many other factors that can enter yeah. uh, their influence and uh, especially uh, the low level of corruption in Rwanda, the easy yeah. access uh, uh, people with like all African citizen can access uh, and get their visa at the airport. Yeah. You know, there is like um, uh, the pro-arbitration judiciary, uh, actually uh, among the people who are well, trained by Kiak, judges were trained, so especially all judges of commercial courts, so understand that uh, they are really very supportive. Up yeah. to now, uh, I can adjust those four aspects as uh, the main um, reason of the success. Yeah, yeah. I completely, completely agree, especially about the, the importance of people who have used the center, sending the message yeah. to others about the quality of yeah. service. And that means, as I found, and as you know, in each case, you cannot compromise on the service. Yeah. You have to treat each, each user as a potential advertisement for your center or the opposite, a negative advertisement. So yeah. if you let the standard slip, that person will say to five people, ah, oh, you know, Kiak, it's, it's not so reliable. And they will tell five people and they will tell five people. It's this, yeah. um, this commitment that you have to have to completely consistent service, mm -hmm. speed, efficiency, all of those things. And I, I, I think that's what we try to do. And, and clearly at, mm -hmm. at Kiak, you recognize that because it's, yeah. it's the foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's, um, that's it. And, and I just want also, because I've uh, shared about our experience, about our cases, our, actually our case load is uh, beyond now 160. So mm -hmm. you understand that we have a really growing number. And um, I can say like uh, more than... Uh, 39% uh, uh, international cases. Um, I want also to hear from you about mm. uh, your most memorable African arbitration cases uh, while you served at uh, MIAC or after MIAC, uh, where you are serving uh, in many, you know, uh, yeah. uh, law firms uh, involving African parties in arbitration. Yeah. Yes, that's um, it's a good question. There's a there's a few things that stand out. Obviously, some matters are confidential, so, so we simply can't talk about them. Of course. Them. I, I should mention the first hearing that we hosted as MIAC in Mauritius. Mm -hmm. um, for, for some months, we didn't have any activity. You know, we were just busy promoting the center and getting it going. But in the, in the uh, second year, we hosted our first full hearing in Mauritius. And at that time, there was no dedicated hearing space. The hearing mm -hmm. center had to be created in a hotel. Wow. So you find a hotel, find a big conference room, and you have to turn an empty room into a fully functioning uh, hearing space. And it was a proper international arbitration involving, I think, a Zambian party and a, uh, and a European party. And there was a, a foreign arbitrator coming in, and the, the stakes were very high. The amount of money in dispute was, was very high. So there could be no compromises on the service. And I remember it was, a, it was very nerve-wracking trying to get this thing working perfectly, as good as the um, IDRC in London or as good as HKIAC in, in Hong Kong or whatever. And we had great um, support. Um, the, the hotel were excellent and were very flexible. It's one thing that they do well in Mauritius. The hotels are very, very good, very good standard. Uh, the parties were all very helpful and they came early to test the setup um, before the hearing started properly so that we could check it was working perfectly without wasting any of the arbitrator's time or, or, or losing time in the hearing. Um, there, was, uh, there was a lot of support from um, the transcribing company who set up the IT system and it, I, I remember the, the sense of satisfaction sitting watching the hearing going ahead and, and proceeding smoothly was, was huge. And I felt in a small way that by having 
that hearing in Mauritius, we were, we were demonstrating that it could be done well. And the idea was that the lawyers involved, the arbitrator, as we were just discussing, they went away and they said to the world, it was okay. It went well, it went smoothly. And after that, there were several other hearings. The PCA, um, who had the office in Mauritius, hosted several very large hearings and did it successfully. So it was really, um, it, was, it was very satisfactory that we, we managed to host that. Um, other hearings have been held in Mauritius, especially through uh, MARC, the MCCI Arbitration Centre. But those hearings were usually held in offices. And this was the first time that we set up a dedicated space, um, mm -hmm. I think. And um, we, were, we were very pleased with that. Other, other cases, um, I have two other, two other cases to mention. One I should mention uh, because it's a public case, so I can speak about it openly. And also because it was such a, it was a significant case in the history of, of African arbitration, I think, which is that when I moved to Stevenson Harwood, um, and I, I want to acknowledge Kamal Shah, who was the, the, my colleague there and the head of the Africa group, uh, who I went to join, who, who many people will know, and who's a great, um, you know, he's a great uh, leader in, in this field. It, he was working on a case called NNPC, the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation against ITCO. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one of the most memorable cases I've worked on for a number of reasons. One is the, the, the time it was going on. When I joined, it had been going on for 12 years um, in the English courts. And I, I worked on the final two years of it. The second reason is that the issues were so shocking uh, because mm -hmm. the, the allegation made by NNPC was that IPCO had essentially forged a very large number of documents in the arbitration itself. So an arbitration had happened in Nigeria with a panel of distinguished arbitrators. And the allegation was that most of the documents used to demonstrate the value of the claim were simply created by you know, changing and photocopying or sticking something over and photocopying that or taking blank <laughs> form and just filling them in with invented details. And, and it was a startling case from that point of view. In fact, it settled before anybody made a decision. So there's never been a finding as to the extent of that forgery or fraud and the other side, ICO denied um, being involved in it at all. They said that it was uh, somebody else's responsibility. But it was uh, a, a shocking case because of the, the, the scale of the fraud and the level. Of course, now we see in PNID a case where similar matters are being alleged, but on another scale, you know, a matter of billions rather than just hundreds of millions. But NNPC stands out for that reason. Also because it was a good example of lawyers in um, Nigeria and London working together very effectively. In Nigeria, it was a firm called Babalakin and Co, uh, who did really excellent work alongside the London team. And it demonstrated to me the value of, of that co-counseling relationship and having serious, substantial involvement from the African firm as well as, as, well as the international firm to get, to get the best possible results. That was partly because a lot of the evidence was in Nigeria, a lot of the issues were Nigerian issues, um, partly because there were proceedings going on in Nigeria at the same time as in London, so they had to be coordinated and, and run yeah. together. Um, that case also was the, the first time I visited um, NNPC Towers in Abuja in Nigeria. And so the, the opportunity to go to the office and see how it actually worked in real life and to meet the people, to meet the GMD, to meet the lawyers, um, it was very enlightening for me to understand how a big African organization like that can work and the challenges they face, the complexity of the organization. Um, so that was very interesting. I want to mention one other case because it's a topic which I'm very interested in at, at the moment. I can't go into details because it's, it's very confidential. Um, it was a case where there was an unspecified allegation of corruption. There was a belief in, in another, it's completely separate from an NPC, another case involving East Africa. There was a belief that there had been corruption in procuring a contract. And rather like PNID that we're seeing unfolding at the moment, during the arbitration, this allegation was not made. It was discussed in a vague way, but nobody ever said, we are making this case, here is our evidence. So you had a classic situation of a suspicion of corruption lurking in the background, not being enough to justify the 
tribunal investigating and making a finding. And as you will know, it's a very hot topic at the moment, the extent to which tribunals should investigate spontaneously um, of their own motion corruption matters. In that case, the allegation wasn't properly made. And I, I must admit, I feel that in future, lawyers in situations like that should be more proactive and more positive about finding the evidence of corruption and alleging it in arbitrations. Because what we see with PNID now is that the corruption that was suspected all along is only being brought out very late. So it's harder to, to prove it. And also it's more difficult to get the court to listen. You know, they've just had a very big hearing and a very big decision that allows them to make the allegation of corruption in PNID. But it demonstrates the importance, if you suspect corruption, of trying to get the allegation raised in the arbitration itself and to prove it there rather than leaving it for later. And I think that's, in my experience, that's potentially a feature of, of African arbitrations that sometimes evidence isn't brought out at an early stage and has to be deployed later. And it, it unfortunately, it potentially undermines what can be a good case to leave it. So, um, Fidel, can I, can I bounce a question um, back to you as well? Because uh, I, I mentioned a moment ago, international firms, African firms, um, no. I know it's part of the mission of, of AFA, the African Arbitration Association, to grow the involvement of African firms in international cases and to give them a better role and increase diversity. W what do you see at KIAC in terms of the lawyers who are handling your cases? Is it mainly local firms? Are there a lot of foreign firms, international firms? Is it changing? What's your perception of that? Yeah, uh, yeah Duncan, I think uh, uh, since 2012 when uh, KIAC was established, the setup of uh, legal market is also changing. Mm. Uh, let me just um, base on uh, the facts, especially the language aspect. Yeah. Uh, in many of our courts, um, proceedings are mainly in King Rwanda, our local language. And um, in few cases, when Paris ask, they can be granted to do proceedings in um, either French or, or English, depending on the Paris. Uh, but um, I can say that uh, normally Kinyarwanda is the most used language. Right. Uh, for arbitration, you know, it's different uh, because uh, uh, parties are free to use the uh, choose the language of their proceedings. And uh, I can say now that uh, in all, uh, I can say that in most of our cases, uh, like, like only for the last year, uh, statistics, 67% of our arbitration were done in English. So mm. we had also a few cases in French. And, did uh, you say, sorry, did you say 67%? 67%. 67%. You, you understand that 67% uh, uh, um, uh, for all international cases, uh, we've had uh, uh, foreign lawyers mm. uh, in one of another way. Some uh, law firms from abroad were directly involved in the case, but uh, uh, there were also possibilities of, uh, you know, a partnership between uh, uh, law firms from abroad and local fa law firms. And um, we also have some law, law firms that are like, uh, uh, you know, always cooperate with the foreign firms, but uh, they have also worked on ad hoc cases, like, 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 like an ad hoc arbitration and case in arbitration, and uh, the local firm is hired by the international firm to help them because, as you know, when you are in arbitration, there are matters that can even jump to the local courts. It can be appointment, challenging arbitrators, as well as uh, when you, get, you go to enforcement, you can also, they can also, um, you know, uh, challenge uh, the award. So um, there is that collaboration between uh, law firms from abroad and law firm from uh, Rwanda. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, very uh, observed after the establishment of the center. So before the establishment of Kigali International Arbitration Center, of course, we had some rare cases in criminal matters that involved also foreign lawyers. But uh, in um, commercial dispute, mainly with arbitration, we are seeing the, the rise of uh, collaboration. And it's a good thing. 
And I can see it also in a way of capacity building. When you have like, um, you know, foreign lawyers that are in international arbitration cases, there are many things they, 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 they do to mentor their mm -hmm. uh, local uh, partners here. Uh, let me again recognize that arbitration uh, started uh, officially in one in 2012, after the establishment of the center. So I understand that uh, our lawyers needed that experience and exposure from uh, well-trained and experienced, experienced uh, lawyers from abroad. So that uh, aspect of uh, mentorship, partnership, collaboration has uh, um, helped them to just grow as um, of arbitrators and uh, as uh, legal counsels in arbitration. Yeah. And um, uh, to this point also, I want to mention also that uh, the aspect of the, the fact that uh, Rwanda is um, a, a country that was uh, for many years uh, seen as uh, civil law jurisdiction. Yeah. But uh, during the recent years, uh, it has also adopted some legislation from the common law uh, uh, system. So you understand that in arbitration, We've seen this uh, mixture of uh, arbitration uh, based from uh, inspired by common law and inspired by civil law, and it's a good thing. So that collaboration has uh, really helped our lawyers to grow. When you talk about like examination, cross examination, for um, um, Rwandan lawyers who never been arbitration, it was quite new. But now those who have been arbitration. Uh, because they have like worked with uh, their partners from Kenya, partners from uh, UK, we've had cases from you know it, it's a it's a learning experience. So I can say that uh, uh, with uh, the creation of the center, we are observing that kind of uh, collaboration between foreign law firms and uh, local law firms, which yeah. is a really good thing. Yeah. Uh, on that note, before um, I just ask you another question, I just want also to oh. tell people that the issue you had in Mauritius about uh, uh, the infrastructure, we, we don't, we, we need to observe that issue in, at Kiak. Only for the first year, we were like renting a building of the private sector federation, but okay. uh, uh, from the second, 2014, uh, the center bought uh, its um, uh, building and uh, uh, the building is really well uh, uh, equipped with, uh, you know, hearing rooms. Actually, you've visited the center, I think. Yes, so, I have, yes, yeah. I've seen, I've seen so, it. So we, we don't have that issue of bring, be taking people to a hotel for arbitration. No. So especially for international arbitration cases, people want a place with privacy. And yes. we've also hosted some uh, international arbitration from other institutions, especially yeah. Uh, uh, the commissar, uh, we've also hosted this uh, the ICC um, uh, arbitration case. So you understand mm. that uh, yeah. our uh, 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 um, uh, building and uh, our arbitration rooms are well equipped to uh, help yeah. for, uh, you know, those who want to have a very good yeah. hearing. It's and interesting it you should say that because well, yeah. at the beginning we, we didn't have a hearing centre that was available. Now there's two in Mauritius, but I think looking back, I can see now the importance of being able to say to the world, here is the centre. If you have a hearing, this is where it will take place. Mm -hmm. To be able to show that real physical space is really important. In fact, a lot of the administration, of course, is not hearings. It's, it's the office. It's done uh, in collaboration mm -hmm. with the arbitrators. But if you don't have a hearing room, I think psychologically people feel hmm, yeah. they're not quite there. They're not quite set up. And we, we lacked that for a little while. But I should say Mauritius now has, has two centres because Mark has a hearing room and MIAC now has a hearing centre as well. So yeah. uh, it's well catered for now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, since 2012, yeah. when we were in Mauritius, uh, up mm. to now, it's like, uh, I can say, eight years. Yeah. How have you seen the practice uh, of African uh, arbitration change over recent years? Um, well, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because it's not, it's not a very long time in the scheme of things. You know, for the, for the senior mm -hmm. arbitrators who've been practicing for 
30 or 40 years, oh, yes. they will say, oh, eight years is, is a blink of an eye. It's not very long at all. Um, you know, people have cases that go on for longer than eight years. But having said that, I, mm -hmm. I think personally that this has been a time of very significant change. Um, one respect in which it's been a time of great change has been the establishment of a, a number of quality arbitral institutions on the continent. So when, when I was starting up, um, PIAC was, was new. It was, it was quite new. Uh, the Lagos Court of Arbitration was getting going. You know, the, um, the, the Lagos Court of Arbitration building, um, which, uh, you know, they, they built in those, in those years, was, mm -hmm. was new and newly opened. Um, other arbitration centers were just beginning to start. And it was, it was a, a time of birth for the idea that more arbitration should be held on the continent. And when I went to countries and spoke to African lawyers and African government, that message came across very, very clearly. You know, I remember going to, um, going to Accra uh, and talking to the then Attorney General, uh, who was called Mrs. Apia Opon, who mm -hmm. had been involved in two international arbitrations on behalf of Ghana and had come away with a feeling of bitterness about the imbalance in the procedure. Not that the decision was necessarily wrong, but that the process felt as if it favoured the European party or the American party. Mm -hmm. And that message came not just from her, not just from Ghana, but from a range of, of places. And it, it made a very strong effect on me that there was an important job to be done by Africans, but which hopefully I could help with, of increasing the idea that, that arbitration should be done on the continent. And then if we fast forward to 2016, ICA took place in Mauritius, which was a, a great event. And I was very, very proud to be involved in helping to organize that. Um, and on the last day, we had a, a meeting which was essentially, in a way, the first meeting of the AFAA, um, the African Arbitration Association. In mm -hmm. fact, the, the association had not yet been formed. But that meeting that was convened in Mauritius at ICA gave birth to a, the idea of having an association, which was not, to be clear, an association of lawyers who do Africa work, mm -hmm. because those associations existed already. This was yeah. an association of African lawyers, which maybe would invite lawyers from outside Africa to be members as guests and to join as guests. But ultimately, it would be based in Africa, it would be run by an African lawyer, and it would have an African committee. And I remember sitting there at this table, and I, I should say, just by way of a quick story, the night before had been a very big party. So mm -hmm. I was a bit tired, people were a bit tired sitting around the table. Um, I remember the night before, I think was the party organized by Sherman and Sterling, which yeah. was a great, great I, I that one as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and all sorts of things happened. Um, but we went to this meeting and there was a real feeling in this meeting of, something new starting. And I can't remember everyone who was there, but the room was packed. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the board members now of, of AFA were there, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, like uh, Bio Ojo and I think um, Mrs. Rose. Gaston Kenfak. Yeah, yeah um, Gaston Kenfak was certainly there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and many others, I, I can't mention them all, Rukia, uh, was, we were there. Uh, it's my myself. Yeah, that's right. Ismail Salim was there. Yeah. yeah. And there was a, a very strong feeling there that something new was starting and that there was a belief that um, this was going to be an important project. And it was great to see the progress from 2012 to 2016, this belief that this was going to work and was going to be a big deal. And the belief that there were the arbitrators in Africa, the lawyers in Africa, and the arbitration institutions in Africa to actually to, to make it happen properly uh, and to get it going. And I was, you know, I was there as a guest, as an observer, um, just to see what was happening. But it was it was inspiring. And I think that change that we saw there has continued more lawyers being involved in cases, more African arbitrators being appointed, more awareness of the value of having local knowledge and experience, even on the highest level, 
tribunals. And it's a shift, I think, from uh, a lot of the lawyers who are involved in African cases used to be either oil and gas lawyers or mining lawyers or energy mm-hmm. lawyers. They weren't really Africa lawyers. They were just involved in the resource areas, the sectors which Africa was known for. And we're shifting away from that, I think, to recognizing the value and the importance for the legitimacy of the process of having Africans involved. That doesn't mean every lawyer has to be African or every arbitrator has to be African, but at least a proper proportion of them should be. Uh, and that's something now I think that's being worked together. And I, I think all of my recent cases relating to African problems, projects have involved this co-counseling, this working together on cases, which I, I believe in quite passionately. Um, and it's produced better results. It's produced um, uh, a better understanding of what the client wants, a better understanding of the evidence that's being adduced to the tribunal. And hopefully, um, although I, I am cautious in saying this, hopefully a bit of learning for everybody involved in as well. Everyone involved has got a bit better. And twi- in two of my hearings, I've asked African lawyers to contribute to the advocacy, which I think is something which is neglected. Sometimes you, you put a QC out the front and he does all the talking or she does all the talking and that's it. But involving the African lawyers in the advocacy is a much more powerful demonstration of their proper participation in the case than merely them sitting behind. So I'm really, I'm really keen on, on developing that and, and seeing that happening more and more. Um, so yeah, it, it is changing and I think it's, um, I think it's, it, it's a, real, a real phenomenon. What, what do you think um, KIAC has in its future? Uh, what, what changes do you see coming? Uh, what direction are you, are you moving in, do you think? Uh, thanks a lot for the question. Yeah, uh, I can say that our future is uh, really packed and bright, packed because we have plenty of things to do. As you know, uh, when you've started uh, operating, you have to make sure that you keep the, you know, the loop to what you are doing. You keep... Uh, uh, you know, adjusting, changing, uh, you know, um, uh, to make sure that you, you keep the race. Because as yeah. you know, uh, I call it the race because um, there are many centers now. It's not that we are in competition, but uh, it's also, uh, it means that uh, there are, you know, standards, uh, standards that are really also growing, especially with uh, uh, this uh, post-COVID season. Yeah. So you have to uh, position yourself to make sure that you respond to the needs of uh, uh, the stakeholders, especially the parties who will be, you know, um, coming to the center. Uh, so I can say that uh, we, uh, number one, you know, Rwanda is a country which is really open to its national trade, and uh, it means that uh, the center has to uh, be um, ready to serve whenever there are many transactions coming to the country, because when you have like investors coming, you can, uh, you know, uh, recall for the, the last four years, Rwanda has been uh, among the, uh, you know, top African countries in doing business. So you have to make sure that you're also positioning the center uh, to serve if, uh, you know, uh, 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 foreign investors are coming to the country. You have to make sure that, uh, uh, you keep training your arbitrators, you keep also enlisting and enrol- enrolling other new arbitrators from our other continent as we keep updating our uh, uh, arbitration lists and make sure that we also uh, 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 ensure that the diversity is there. Um, uh, you know, diversity in both languages, in gender, and regions. Uh, in other aspect, we uh, actually recently, you've heard this, We've uh, now opened a branch of uh, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And uh, the, 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 the branch uh, uh, was, um, you know, a project for the center. We tried to work with the CIAP to uh, try to make sure that we can organize those who have been trained and make sure that uh, we can have a branch because you always need uh, good professionals, uh, legal professionals and arbitrators, well trained people. And the center cannot keep training. So the center is busy with uh, case management and, uh, you know, uh, uh, awareness information marketing, but you need uh, an institution that can train. So yeah. if uh, yeah. the CR branch 
we are really uh, uh, moving uh, ahead and in a good direction. Yeah. And um, in other aspect also, we, we try also to, you know, um, uh, I can say uh, to just uh, modernize uh, as we can our case management uh, system. You know, uh, with technology, uh, when you just uh, 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 sleep a week, uh, you realize that you are lost. So there are things you have to update your yeah. system, uh, update the platforms, uh, uh, revisit the rules as well, because uh, you you know, uh, uh, revisiting the rules of the center for like now, we are revisiting our rules to make sure that uh, we can adjust to the new norm, especially with uh, virtual hearings and uh, many other requirements uh, with uh, the age of technology now. So yeah. those are also aspects where we are like trying to put our, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, focus and um, Fidel, can, I, um, can I can I can um, I just note the time because we're we're getting towards twelve o'clock already. Um, yeah. So we're running quite short on time. And uh, Rukia, I think, has encouraged us to answer the questions that have been asked in the Q and A box. So um, yeah. we should we should spend some time looking at those and answering those because um, it's very important that. Uh, we reflect what the yeah, audience yeah, yeah. is thinking. Uh, so uh, actually, the um, yeah, actually on the questions on Q&A, uh, there are some that are asked to me. Yep. There are others I think you can also uh, try to respond to. Uh, yeah, there is I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm, if it's okay with you, I, I can see there's a question from Funke Adekoya. Uh -huh. uh, who we're very um, we're honoured is listening, as as you know, who's a, a a senior arbitrator and senior advocate of Nigeria. And Funke yeah. asks, um, Duncan spoke of co-counsel relationships in international arbitration. How can African law firms showcase their experience and thereby build such relationships through the AFAA platform, or must they do this on their own? Um, and I, I, you, you may have some comments as well. My, my reaction to that question is that um, there's an enormous amount of value we all know in in arbitration to uh, personal knowledge of individuals it's true across the world in every field but it's particularly true in arbitration because in arbitration you you are choosing usually um, an arbitrator to appoint a, a particular individual or you're choosing lawyers to represent you so developing the the personal knowledge of individuals is is key and so through AFAA or through any other um, networks that you have um, getting introductions to people and having the face-to-face -face meetings is remarkably effective um, I still believe for example that in the United States and across Europe there are a lot of lawyers who have a real lack of knowledge and understanding of the the expertise and the experience that there is in in Africa itself. So um, I think there's a lot of work to be done to to get introductions through your networks and speak to people. Obviously, in the in the time of COVID, it's difficult. Although uh, a video meeting is better than nothing, and and just share your experiences with them and talk about what you've done. No CV. Um, and no website can speak as powerfully as a, a, a five minute conversation with someone where you actually hear what they say and what their experience is of handling cases. So, so my, my suggestion would be that um, a, a sort of slowed down, long term speed networking, where you're constantly using your network to get introduced to new people and speaking to them and seeing what shared interests you have and potential work you can do together um, is is the way forward and it's it, it's also important for breaking what's sometimes called the international arbitration club where people know each other and keep appointing each other and keep referring work to each other breaking into that it, it, it often involves getting introductions through someone you know to someone you don't know um, and getting to know them that way the other thing i would say is that um and Fouke will know this from personal experience, senior experienced arbitrators like meeting people and talking to people. 
They go to conferences. They speak to young lawyers who are coming up, who are new to the field, but very interested. Um, they usually have a, a great appetite for that and a great enthusiasm for it. I mean, you think of arbitrators like, like Funke or, or um, other senior arbitrators like Dorothy Ufot, or in, in Europe, um, people like um, uh, Albert Jan Vandenberg, who, who I know came to Mauritius and has been to a lot of African conferences and done a lot of work. Their, their passion for the subject means that they want to speak to new people. So one thing I would recommend to lawyers is um, either at events or by being introduced to them and having a chat with them, get to know some arbitrators, even quite senior ones. You'll be surprised by how receptive they are and um, it will just allow you to get to know them a little bit uh, and to become more familiar with their world and what they do. Um, you don't need much time. A half an hour chat is quite enough to, to get to know someone a little bit. Uh, and breaking down those barriers, I think, is, is really important. We are essentially in a professional um, relationship um, amongst the whole arbitration community. And there's no reason why we shouldn't get to know each other better and speak um, outside of the hearing room uh, as a way of breaking down barriers. So I would encourage that. Um, Fidel, can I, do you want to answer any of the questions? Um, there is a question about um, Rwandan courts and African courts, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, actually, I've uh, responded to uh, some of them on, uh, you know, uh, by chats, chatting, uh, but I want again to repeat that uh, actually, uh, Wilfred Mutubo has been here for an arbitration and um, yeah, what he's saying is true. Sometimes uh, you can have uh, slow, pro you know, slow um, uh, procedures in the court for challenging an arbitral award. But uh, uh, the judiciary is now um, taking the matter at hand because, uh, uh, you know, we, we've uh, recently uh, uh, reviewed, I can call it reform on our judiciary, which included now uh, the Court of Appeal. So there are cases that are, were like, um, uh, you know, um, uh, stuck in uh, some of the judiciary, especially the Supreme Court that are now, uh, uh, you know, uh, sent to the Court of Appeal. So you, I can ensure, feel afraid that uh, with the new reform, we will not have uh, more delays. And uh, there is also a policy of uh, taking some of the cases in uh, mediation, using mediation, which can also reduce the uh, uh, backlog. So I can say that, uh, we, for now, it's not really taking long. Actually, the average time for a court um, procedure in commercial courts is uh, between four and six months. So you understand that uh, when compared to many other countries, we are doing uh, really great, especially when you read, you did, read the, the recent uh, Doing Business report, you see that uh, Rwanda is doing very well on um, uh, enforcement contracts, uh, that very aspect. Yeah. Um, uh, Fidel, also, um, there's a know. note from, from Rukia. Uh, Rukia would like to say a few words about AFAA and, uh, and Funke's question. Can we, can we let her say oh, something? Yes. Uh, oh yes, Rukia, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say quickly to Funke's question that um, the AFA actually offers membership to both associations and to law firms. So African law firms can also be members of the AFA and also African arbitration associations can be members of the AFA. And they are then um, able to take advantage of the benefits of memberships, which include all the AFA platforms in terms of showcasing their work, in terms of networking as well, because members are able to communicate with each other on the AFA platform when they do log in and there are forums that you can start if you're just not aware of, but there are several AFA membership uh, benefits when someone logs in. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Great. Uh, th thanks, uh, Rukia. And uh, I think Funke, Funke is a well-informed lawyer and uh, actually we don't have her on our list. I wonder why she's not our partner. Uh, that was uh, just a joke. Um, do, do, Rukia, do we still have a few minutes? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I want to again ask uh, um, Duncan, um, does it really work 
for African and Foreign Council to partner and co-counsel from your experience? Uh, in a word, the yes. I'm asking this, the reason I'm asking this is yeah. we see them partnering as an early transition, but we don't know how easy it is uh, for them to collaborate. Yeah. In, in a word, it, it does. Um, obviously, each case, the council team has to be put together to get the best result for the client. That's the only, that's the only goal that we're, we're really interested in. That's why we're paid to do the work. But there's no reason why the work can't be shared more. Um, one area that I think is, is of interest is that um, traditionally, you would often use the international firm for bulky disclosure tasks and that kind of thing. Because, you know, you've got an office in London with 20 junior lawyers and they can spend many, excuse me, many long hours um, looking through documents and selecting documents for disclosure and this kind of thing. The world is changing so that that's not necessarily the case anymore. Because um, you, for example, you can use technology now so that the review is all done online. It's all done electronically. You don't need to be in London or in Lagos or, uh, or, or in Harare to do the document review. You can be in all sorts of places. And so African firms, I think, can, can start taking on more of that burden. And I've already mentioned um, the value of having co-counseling in the advocacy. If there's a particular aspect that the African lawyer can speak to, let them speak to it in the hearing rather than putting one you know, London uh, barrister or, or solicitor up front. So that would be my that would be my view. I think it does. Well, that's really good. Um, Fidel, can we um, maybe finish? Um, you you answered in writing a, a question from Jose Chinjamba um, from Angola, who asked about arbitration processes happening um, outside of Africa when they're relating to to African countries, and you said you said that we can show the world that we're able to administer cases in, in Africa. The other thing I want to highlight is that it doesn't matter where the seat of arbitration is. If, if you have a contract, for example, that provides for seat of arbitration in London, or if you're making a contract and the, uh, the international party insists on the seat of arbitration in Singapore, there's no reason why a hearing can't take place in Rwanda or Lagos. And, and the arbitration institutions on the continent, including me when, when I was in one, I've been saying this for years. And as time goes on and the facilities get better, it's becoming more and more true. And it's becoming more and more important that we keep pushing that message and saying, remember, if you have a hearing that has something to do with Rwanda, or if you have a hearing that has something to do with Kenya, and you need a neutral place, but not too far away for the hearing, Rwanda is there and it's just as good. Yeah. Um, COVID-19 maybe is going to affect everyone's ability to travel and we're going to do more remote hearings um, but also it will change people's mindset I think about where is the best place to do the hearings um, and it will it will open their eyes to, to having them in different places. I think we're probably running out of time aren't we? Oh yes um, um, I, I think I've responded to uh, I can Okange, he asks if uh, we, we have uh, uh, the possibility to organize trainings for fellows uh, of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I say to him that uh, we regularly organize trainings and uh, we probably have one by the end of the year. Yep. So we will uh, advertise it, we inform them. So it's an accelerated route to fellowship, but uh, it will all depend with, uh, um, you know, the travel restrictions. So we have to fly at trainers from abroad yeah. and uh, we don't want to do it during this season but uh, there is also a possibility of doing it online so yeah. we'll um, inform uh, our partners yeah. well i um i don't want to advertise the chartered institute too much but i did my fellowship training uh, last year and I have to say it's very enjoyable because it's very interactive you do it in a group and you you do a yeah. lot of talking and discussion so that's actually also a good way to meet other people who are interested in the field, yeah. uh, sometimes from other jurisdictions. Um, I really enjoyed the, the time I spent with my group doing the fellowship mm -hmm. um, course last year, yeah. which was excellent. Yeah, so um, uh, if um, 
maybe we can uh, I can ask the last question because uh, time is uh, uh, running. You have been in London for five years uh, since leaving Mauritius. Uh, would you consider living in Africa at some point of your career? Uh, is, is that an invitation for the I'm only joking, only joking. An invitation only joking. and a question. Yeah. <laughs> Curiosity um, at the same time. I'm only, only joking. Um, the, the answer is, is, is obviously yes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm lucky, fingers crossed, I have a fairly long career ahead of me. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not someone who wants to retire as soon as possible. Um, so, uh, so I've got lots of time. And um, I, I always say, every time I go to a place, um, on the continent. I say after a few days I have to leave. I spend all my time in meetings. I spend all my time in, in conferences. Um, it, 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 would be, it would be a wonderful thing to, to spend some time actually living. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate if the time was right. Um, wouldn't hesitate to do it because um, it, it's funny if, if you if you have visited Africa a lot but never lived there, you don't know what it's like to live there, but you understand how good, how, how special it could be, I think. So I'm, I'm very enthusiastic. So I'm not, I'm not inviting people to make me offers of jobs at the moment, but um, I would certainly do it uh, one day. And of course, I won't name where I would live because I don't want to express favoritism towards any city or country. Um, uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm completely open-minded, but I, I think it's um, it, it's a genuine interest for international arbitration practitioners to spend time in the region mm -hmm. because it's it's coming up and it's it's getting more and more um, interesting. Oh, so that's, that's good. Answer. That's good. Uh, if not Mauritius, uh, Rwanda and East Africa are welcome for you. Thank you. I know, are welcoming. So you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we thank uh, all our participants and um, I don't want to go beyond our time, but um, we, we've uh, responded to some of uh, the questions. I would like to invite them to visit uh, the website of African Arbitration Association, as well as um, you know, uh, considering uh, joining the association. It's a good platform. It's a good forum where you can learn from others you can also, uh, you know, um, uh, influence the association uh, to play its key role in promoting arbitration in Africa. Uh, we also encourage you to visit uh, many arbitration centers, including KIAG and others, and see if uh, uh, any occasion arises, you can, um, you know, uh, uh, do business with those centers. I mean, doing business with them means that if you have like a dispute or want to refer a case to those centers, especially you can, um, you know, put uh, arbitral clauses in many of the contracts you are drafting. Because I'm saying this because I know there are many lawyers, uh, that some I know, and um, others will be following this uh, 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 discussion um, um, after this session. Thank you again, and welcome to the next webinar. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much to you, Fidel, and thank you, Afa and Rukia. Thanks a lot.